Turn with me, please, first of all, if you will be so kind, just for a moment, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, the Last Supper, the Last Passover. In verse 21, as they were eating the, the Seder, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, surely not I, Lord. And he another answered, he who dipped his hand with me in this bowl, this is dipping up the sop in the, in this, in, in the Haggadah and in the Seder ritual, is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Yeshua, Jesus said to him, You've said it yourself. Judas, of course, as we pointed out probably thousands of times, is the son of perdition, is a major type and probably the most major type, certainly in the New Testament, of the Antichrist who was to come. They are both called the son of perdition, and the New Testament always describes Antichrist's modus operandi and behavior and the character of Judas. For instance, in 1 John, they were out from among us, but they were not really of us. The son of perdition, both of them into money. And while many people have been demon-possessed, it is Judas and the Antichrist who are Satan possessed. They're not demonically possessed, they are satanically possessed. Of Judas, we're told Satan entered him. As we pointed out multiple times in both Testaments, the prophecies of Judas and the Old Testament included. Whenever we see something about Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition, the Holy Spirit is trying to show us something about the Antichrist who is to come. And we've looked at this many times, this subject. And we have a book, Shadows of the Beast, and we look at the various types of Antichrist throughout Scripture and church history. We also uh, have looked at the fact that there are many Antichrists, that there are many Antichrists, and that there will be many Antichrists and many false prophets pointing to Antichrists in the last days. And finally, we pointed out that there's not only an Antichrist, and these two beasts from Revelation, who are both Antichrist, the Antichrist and false prophet, as we call them. But there is a spirit of Antichrist. It is a spirit in the world. And just as the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the coming of Christ, the spirit of Antichrist is preparing the world and the harlot church for the coming of the Antichrist. The church, the faithful church, is the ecclesia, the ones called out of the world. And the Holy Spirit is preparing those called out from the world for the coming, the return of Jesus, return of Christ. So too, the spirit of Antichrist is preparing the world. And the harlot church, which is part of the world, although it pretends to be the church, as getting ready for the coming of the Antichrist. Now, again, I don't want to beat the same old drum, but we've pointed out many times the false religious systems of the world. Satan will unite them, as we'll come to again in a few moments. But colloquially, when Christians use the term Babylon, as we've said in the past, they were normally speaking about the Roman church, liberal Protestantism, the World Council of Churches, Eastern Orthodoxy, or one of the pseudo-Christian cults like Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, Christadelphians, etc. That was Babylon 30, 40 years ago to born-again Christians. But now it's gone beyond that. As we speak here in Great Britain, or in Great Britain, I'm in Ireland, but in, 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 in Britain, the Baptist Union is discussing having homosexual and lesbian clergy. They're professing to be evangelical. In the United States, the Southern Baptist Convention, under its former president, J.D. Greer, said, as we pointed out, Baptists must be 
the number one spokesman for homosexual and lesbian rights, which to them means the right to adopt children and bring them up that way, among other things. Um, Babylon is now mainstream evangelical churches and denominations. Uh, I first saw this coming some years ago with the counterfeit revivals coming out of Toronto and Pensacola and with things like the Elam movement and the Assemblies of God, formerly credible Pentecostal denominations and movements that were taken in by these counterfeit revivals, thinking it was the Holy Spirit or saying it was the Holy Spirit, even though the fruit of the Spirit was self-control, ikrete in Greek, not the lakme. But we have no end of recordings dating back to that time addressing these issues. That's not the issue I primarily want to look at today, deception within the church. Um, we've talked about that. We've talked about it even, even recently, um, looking at the false teachers who are preparing the way for Antichrist within the church. Today, I want to look at another aspect, another aspect that is too often ignored. It is entirely correct that we look at the Roman papacy, or it is entirely correct that we look at backslidden evangelicism that has gone into apostasy over a host of issues, including the homosexual thing. Um, it is entirely appropriate, and not only appropriate, vitally necessary, that we address those issues, deception within the church. But there is another kind of deception that has gained way in the church that is too often being understated. Christians broadly, uh, at least premillennial Christians and Christians who are being led by the Holy Spirit to understand that the constellation of contemporary world events are of prophetic significance be they things in the Middle East, be they things of, of population control, be, or, or, or even the misuse of pandemics for political purposes, trend towards so-called global resets, um, a liberal world order, a new world order, call it what you will. And these things are no longer conspiracy theories. You've had major recognized international leaders using these very terms. You see that George Bush Sr. said New World Order. You see the range, a panorama of world leaders who become disciples of Schwab in the World Economic Forum. It's Jacinda Ahern in New Zealand and then and, and, uh, Trudeau in Canada, and Andrews in, in Australia, and uh, Zelensky in, in the Ukraine. These are the disciples of Zelensky. Um, and Christians have a sense that these things are going towards the arrival of Antichrist in the political economic sphere. The complication is that in order to oppose this, many well-intentioned Christians are praying for, not wrongly, but praying for, and hoping in some kind of a political opposition to these trends. Now, look, these things must happen. Jesus said they must happen. Since 1983, we've been saying, and I've been saying, that the most we can hope for are Josiah-type revivals, where the Lord tarries, where the inevitable judgment is delayed. God showing mercy to nations and to the church, giving it more time to repent before he comes. But eventually, all hell will literally break loose on earth under Antichrist and false prophet. There can be interim periods of respite. And we've compared this, of course, to the biblical metaphor or illustration of birth pangs. In maternal contractions before a baby is born, there are interim periods of respite but then the contractions come back with an increased uh, ferocity. Well, that's the way the last days are going to be. There can be periods of respite. Many of us would say that Brexit and the election of Donald Trump the first time was a period of respite that God was giving. 
Okay, I would not dispute that point of view. I would be sympathetic to that point of view, but it's only a period of respite. The inevitable must happen. Despite the false teachings of those given to dominionism, kingdom now theology, overrealized eschatology, triumphalism, the people, the kingdom now theology, these are these are false beliefs, false doctrines that give the elect a false hope. So too, and a false expectation. So too, as we've warned many times, is pre-tribulationism. The idea that the church is going to be removed before tribulation. When the word of God simply says the church is going to be removed before the wrath of God, before the orge, not before the thalipsis, before the haronia, not before the tzoris, or so forth. There will be a special tribulation for the Jews who don't believe the time of Jacob's trouble. But Jesus said you'll have tribulation in the world. There is nothing in scripture that says the church will not go through tribulation. Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, after the Megatholipson, after the great tribulation, he will gather his elect. Now, a distinction must be made between great tribulation, as we've pointed out multiple times, and the wrath of God. Once the faithful church is removed, the wrath of God is poured out on the kingdom of Antichrist. That is true. We are not appointed unto wrath. But those who are being groomed or have been inundated with these false expectations that don't worry about persecution, don't worry about falling away, don't worry about apostasy, those things don't concern us. We won't be here. This, this is a false teaching and a false expectation. That, that comes from the devil, even though many sincere Christians may have been bought, bought into this lie. Some of them, as we pointed out before, have gone so far now at a time when pre-tribulationism is collapsing and fewer people are believing it because the Holy Spirit is showing them it's rubbish. It was certainly never believed by the early church, by the people who got their doctrine from the apostles, such as Irenaeus, who got their doctrine from John, via Polycarp after John wrote Revelation. The early Christians who got their doctrine from the apostles never believed this nonsense. It is largely an invention of the Darbius of the um, 19th century. Be that as it may, we've talked about these issues many, many times. All of these things represent deceptions perpetrated against the elect. As Jesus warned, if possible, even the elect will be deceived. But there is another way that I and others have been noticing Christians are being misled now. Marco Quintana has pointed this out, and so have certain others, and they are very, very correct. If you will be so kind, please, turn with me to the book of Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Verse 19, and then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven, and Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. He, he removes kings and establishes kings. God is the Lord of history, and all human government, no matter how good or how evil, must be subjected to him for his purposes. He allows it. If Donald Trump was fraudulently found not to be reelected due to a rigged election, God still allowed that. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm simply saying God allowed it for a purpose. We see back in the Hebrew scriptures, in order to fulfill the prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel, 
the Lord allowed not only the conquest of the Assyrian Empire by the, by the Babylonians, he allowed the destruction of the Babylonian Empire by the Persians in league with the Medes, the Media Persians, and the emergence of Darius the Mede, Cyrus the Great, and so forth, in order to reestablish Israel as a nation in fulfillment of the prophecies of Jeremiah and so forth. God brought about these leaders like Darius and Cyrus for his purpose. It is not something that is a pleasant subject, but let's understand something. That was not the first time God would restore the Jews to their land. There'd be a second time. According to Isaiah 11, the Jews would be displaced from their God-given land and recalled not once but twice, according to Isaiah 11. There is no doubt that the Jews have been recalled to their land. This is the second time in history where it's happened. And those who deny the prophetic significance of contemporary events in the Middle East are deceived. And if they're preachers or their theologians or Bible expositors, they are being used by the devil to deceive others. These things you see in the Middle East, including the rebirth of national Israel, is what Isaiah predicted would happen. It's what Jesus said would happen in Luke 21, Zechariah 12, Matthew 23, and so forth. The Jews must be back in their land for him to return. It's the only way major portions of the book of Revelation and the Old Testament makes sense. It is the only way that we can take a literal view of 2 Thessalonians, even chapter 2, even though there is also a symbolic meaning in it. Let's progress. So, how does this happen that the Jews are regathered a second time? When Theodore Herzl proposed Zionism after the Dreyfus Affair in France, we're going back now to the 19th century, not only most people, but most Jews thought he was crazy. Now, Bible-believing Christians, even going back to the Puritans, believed that the Jews would one day return to the land. You can find evangelical preachers and Bible expositors and authors and theological voices, going back to the 17th century, particularly in England, which was the center of the evangelical so-called world at that time, predicting that the Jews would one day return to Israel. These preachers influenced Cromwell. They influenced a number of people. While there were always Bible-believing Christians who believed in the rebirth of national Israel, it was only a faint aspiration among Jews who had rejected their Messiah. <laughs> or they believed it could only happen when the entire Jewish world turned to Kabbalah and Kabbalistic, to mystical Judaism. This was the teaching of the Hasidic movement. They said, Israel is a state of Jews. It's not a Jewish state. And some of them still say, no Jewish nation can exist until the Messiah comes. There are anti-Zionist, ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Jews. Rabbis were united in condemning Herzl and Zionism as crazy. This includes the Reformed rabbis of the United States, where Jews found their promised land in New York City and in Florida and in, in Southern California. They actually called their synagogues temples as a testimony to the fact that the promised land was not to be in Jerusalem, but the first temple was actually in Carolina in the United States, Reformed Judaism. That was their promised land, America. And you see that today. You see increasingly American Jews alienated from Israel because they're taken in by liberal Democrat politics. Most of them remain liberal Democrats in a party that is following the left. And you see major American Jewish politicians like Chuck Schumer from New York, 
the Senate Majority Leader, and Dianne Feinstein and Blumenthal, you see these American Jews in the same party with rabid anti-Zionists and anti-Semites. Anti you see them with the squad, with Omrit, with Alexander Ortega Cortez, with Omrit the Muslim, with Priyab, the a Palestinian Arab Muslim, pro-Hamas. Why are they in political partnership with people who hate not only Israel, but Jews, when they're Jews themselves? Well, as we pointed out on Catching Up with Jacob, this recapitulates or replays what happened in the time of the Maccabees, where you had Jewish collaborators with the enemies of the Jews, such as Menlaus. But I digress. Let's look at our subject now. The rebirth of this nation, Israel, and its fulfillment of prophecy. How did it happen? When most rabbis condemned Theodore Herzl, when most rabbis condemned Zionism, how did God bring about the rebirth of Israel? Well, let's understand it. If the rabbis of the faithful shepherds of Israel and the Jewish people, which they're not, why did God have to use secular socialist Jews, even communist Jews, to reestablish Israel in fulfillment of the prophecies of his word? Why didn't he use rabbis or religious Jews? Why were the Zionists a secular Jewish movement? who saw salvation in socialism and things of that nature, instead of in religion. This in itself is an indictment of Talmudic Judaism as a false Judaism that has rejected its Messiah. While Bible-believing Christians believed in the restoration of Israel, most rabbis didn't, and some still do not. How does this come about? What made it all switch? I cannot think of two more diabolical figures in human history than Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin. They were six of one, half dozen of another. They were two of a kind. Stalin, of course, was a vehement anti-Semite. He expelled Jews from the Russian Communist Party, and he murdered Jewish leaders like Trotsky, he murdered Trotsky, he had the KGB murder Trotsky in Mexico, he murdered Zinoviev and so forth, and then the Russians carried on their campaign of not allowing the Jews to immigrate to Israel. Okay, they were called refuseniks. Okay, he, that, that was stolen. Hitler tried to exterminate the Jewish race. He killed one-third of world Jewry and two-thirds of continental European Jewry. Had there not been a Stalin and a Hitler, had there not been a Joseph Stalin and an Adolf Hitler, there would be no Israel. Zionism never would have gained momentum even among the Jewish community. Even in the synagogues, it would not have gained popular support had it not been for the Holocaust. Certainly, the United Nations would not have seen the international sympathy for the Jews had there not been an Auschwitz or an Buchenwald and a Treblinka, terrible things, unspeakable things that are demonic bloodbaths. Anti-Semitism at its historically ugliest, although an even uglier anti-Semitism is going to come with the Antichrist and false prophet, something beyond Hitler. Be that as it may, how did it happen? Had it not been for Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, you would not have had the restoration of national Israel. The political support, the international sympathy within the United Nations would not have been there to vote for partition. Zionism would not have gained endorsement even from most Jews, certainly not the sanction of most rabbis had it not been for these terrible things. After Lenin died in Russia and Stalin came to power, the Jews had initially supported Bolshevism, 
some of the Bolshevik leaders had been Jews, and they pointed to the fact that Marx himself was of Jewish descent. He didn't believe in the religion, but he was of Jewish descent, definitely. What was happening here? Well, they supported Bolshevism because they suffered so much during the pogroms at the hands of the Russian Orthodox Church very often, and not necessarily all of the Romanovs, but certainly the Tsars. The pogroms of the 1890s were unspeakable. The reason Jews flocked to New York in such massive numbers was because of what happened in the Tsarist pogroms of the 1890s and so forth. And so Jews logically, from the Stettles, were sympathetic towards something more egalitarian, as they thought it would be. That is communism, or Bolshevism, or socialism. When Hitler corrupted socialism in Germany, and remember, the Nazis were a socialist movement. Hitler was a Darwinist and a socialist. He simply nationalized Darwinism to have a super race, kind of twisting Nietzsche's ideas of the Ubermensch, the Superman, into something Nietzsche himself never said, but that was Hitler. He was a Darwinist, and he was a socialist. The Nazis were the National Socialist Workers' Party. So socialism was corrupted in Germany, in Western Europe. Then it was corrupted in Eastern Europe by Stalin. If you want to read a book that will shock you, read The Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. What Stalin did was unbelievable. These things you see happening now in the Ukraine. That didn't begin with Putin. It began with Stalin. Stalin killed millions and millions and millions of Ukrainians. He systematically starved those people to death in order to meet export quotas to get foreign exchange. That's what socialism and communism did. Socialism and communism have never worked anywhere. Promising justice and equality, they bring a worse oppression and dictatorship than existed before it. That, however, is not our subject now. You take God out of any political economic system, you are going to wind up with something of a demonic, if not satanic nature, in lieu of it. But let's continue. So, these Jewish socialists from Europe they said, we have to have a Jewish version of this. We have to have a Jewish version of socialism. And we will be a model of it. And so they took the passage from the Hebrew scriptures, or le goyim, light to the Gentiles, and they said the Jews will be lights to the Gentiles through Zionism. We will create a system that is socially equitable and where there'll be total economic justice and political egalitarianism, and there won't be any power elite, and this will be our model to present to the world on how to be a light. So salvation will come through political means, through economic redistribution and things of this nature. This was the belief of the early Zionists. This continued to the time of Ben-Gurion. Now, there were other Zionists who followed Jabotinsky and things who didn't subscribe to this fantasy and myth, but they had their own issues. The point being, with rejection of Yeshua, the Messiah, there was no Jewish solution to the Jewish problem, and there was no Jewish solution to fallen man's problem. The solution is in the Jewish Messiah and his salvation. Let's look at this. So. Had Hitler not done what he did, and had Stalin not done what he did, these two tremendously demon-possessed nefarious individuals, wickedness incarnate almost, antichrists, had they not come and done what they did, the prophecies of Matthew 23, Zechariah 12, Isaiah 11, Jeremiah, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera, could never have been fulfilled. 
even if it's a bad king, a bad leader, it is he who changes the times and epics and he establishes and removes kings. But something unique is going to happen. I would point you to our book, Shadows of the Beast, available through the Moria website, Amazon, etc. But look with me, please, to the book of Daniel, chapter 7. The book of Daniel, chapter 7. Here we read a description of the Antichrist, the ultimate Antichrist, and what he will be. But in verse 25 of Daniel 7, he will speak out against the Most High. Wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations to times and law. They will be given into his hand for two times time and a half time. That lordship of history that has always been the prerogative of God will temporarily, for a three-and-a-half-year period, be given over to the Antichrist. Chapter 8 of Daniel goes on to describe this. In verse 23, in the latter period of their rule, when transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue, skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. In other words, it'll not be his human intellect. There'll be a demonic power on back of it. When you see someone supernaturally empowered mentally, intellectually, it is either the Holy Spirit or it's something demonic. How could a paper hanger and a failed artist and a corporal in the German army in World War I have swayed a whole nation? Well, Hitler did it because he was demon-possessed. It was not of his own power. He didn't have the wherewithal to do that. He was demonically possessed. And so we read, <clears throat> skilled in this intrigue, but his power will be mighty, but not of his own power. He'll destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. Again, Hitler is a and and Hitler is an antichrist and a shadow or a historical type of the coming antichrist, but he's not the ultimate antichrist. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence, and he'll magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, even oppose the prince of princes, Jesus and it'll be broken without human agency and so forth. Two times, time and a half time. As it were, as we've said a number of times, the lordship of history will be given into the hands of Antichrist. In other words, as we always put it, Jesus had three and a half years of public ministry. Satan will demand equal time for the Antichrist. Christ had three and a half years of public ministry. Satan will demand equal time for Antichrist. And within those parameters and up to that limit, he will receive it. This is a unique time in history. Other eras in history teach about it, going back to the Roman emperors. Other figures in history teach about it, certainly up to the 20th century with Hitler and Stalin. There are things that foreshadow it, teach about it, hint at it. This is all covered in the book Shadows of the Beast, but this is going to be something totally unique. He will seek to change the times and the law, and he will control the political power, and he will control the economic power. Remember, it is a tripod, economy, politics, and religion. Now, if possible, the elect will be deceived. You can actually watch videos of Rick Warren saying the same things. Politics or government, economics, and religion. Where Rick Warren calls for the unification 
and cooperation of saved Christians with Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Mormons, whoever, to bring in global peace. Global peace will only come when the Prince of Peace returns, a real peace. Other gods, as we've said many times again, are called by Paul demons, the Manoi, or called by Moses demons, Shadim. But it's the public recorded teaching of Rick Warren. We must unite as saved Christians with demon worshipers in order to bring in global peace, even if we don't agree with their God or gods. We have to unite with demon worshipers, teaches Rick Warren. There are many other things about him when he flipped on the homosexual, lesbian issue and so forth. That man is an antichrist spirit. Rick Warren has an antichrist spirit. But look how many Christians are taken in by him. If possible, even the elect will be deceived. But let's continue looking at this. Somehow people get the idea that we can get a Cyrus or a Darius the Mede or a Donald Trump and things are going to be ameliorated. God can and does use such leaders for his purposes. This is true. However, the Antichrist is going to do something phenomenal. He's going to do something what Pompey did to Israel and the Jews. Promising protection from their Iranian, then Persian, called Phrygian, enemies to the east. The Roman general Pompey made a false peace with Israel and got Israel to trust in the Roman Empire for its protection. And they signed on the dotted line. Oh, the Romans, the West, they're going to protect us from the Iranians. Remember, the Iranians are simply the Persians. They are an Aryan nation. They are not like Arabs. They're not a Middle Eastern people. They are a European people who, whose ancestors settled in the Middle East. They are not a, a Semitic people or a Middle Eastern people. Iranians are Persians, Farsi. They are Aryans. They're an Aryan nation. They are anthropological cousins of the Germans who've adopted Shia Islam, but their original religion was Zoroastrianism. They become the leading opponent of Israel, hell-bent on Israel's extermination at the close of the age, according to Jan Daniel 10. Iran is going to try to, uh, to destroy Israel under satanic power. And when that happened, before Christ was born, the Jews signed on the dotted line with Rome in the late Hasmonean period, intertestamental period. And along comes Pompey the general from the Roman triumvirate. And Pompey enters the Holy of Holies. Now we deal with this in the book Shadows of the Beast once again. Whenever you see someone other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement, entering the Holy of Holies, it is a picture of the Antichrist, the abomination of desolations in the holy place. Pompey is a type of the Antichrist, but he bamboozled the Jews into trusting the Romans to protect the Jews from the Iranians, the Aryans, the Persians. The Persians had previously been a friend to the Jews. Then they become a threat. Under the Shah of Iran and the peacock throne of Cyrus, up until the 1970s, 
the Iranians were friends of the Jews, then they become the number one threat. In other words, to understand what's happening now geopolitically with the Iranian threat, you have to go back to understand how it is recapitulating, replaying what happened with Pompeii. If you don't understand history, you'll never understand prophecy. If you don't know what did happen, you will not know, understand what is happening, nor know what is going to happen. And you see Biden trying to placate Iran. These talks have just collapsed in Vienna. Now he's making new talks in Qatar, making these concessions to Iran. You're not going to stop Iran that way. Read Daniel chapter 10. Biden is an evil man. Well, he's controlled by Obama, but that's another issue. Obama seriously betrayed Israel in the UNESCO vote. We talked about these things on catching up with Jacob. Now we're looking at it from the point of view of prophecy. What are we saying? There have always been political leaders who God has raised up to achieve his purposes for Israel and the Jews, just as he has raised up leaders to achieve his purposes for the church. But that does not mean they were always good people. Some were benevolent. Cyrus, apparently Donald Trump, Darius the Mede, Others were terrible people, Hitler and Stalin, but God used them to achieve his prophetic purposes. Well, it's the same now. For Israel, but also for the church. Let's understand something. Long before the Reformation, long before Luther, even before Erasmus, the real seminal influence of the Reformation was Erasmus, not Luther. Long before that, in England, there were the Lollards following John Wycliffe. Then there were the Bohemian Brethren following Jan Hus. Now, these people were terribly persecuted and martyred and killed. Before them was the Waldensians. There were always true believers. There were always saved Christians people who knew the truth about the gospel and whose faith was based more on the word of God, not on tradition. There was always people like that. There were even people caught up in papal religion who knew papal religion was false and said so, and that it was morally debased. People like Savonarola during the Renaissance, but they killed him too. So why Hus and Savranola and these and, and, and the Waldensians and the Lollards that they were all persecuted? They were always true believers. But in the 16th century, something happened. Feudalism declined, and the germinal influence of capitalism emerged. With the end of feudalism, you had the emergence of the nation state, not just the Holy Roman Empire, which was the old, we always say was neither holy nor Roman. You have the birth of nationalism. I'm a German, I'm a Scot, I'm an Englishman, I'm French. The Pope in Rome no longer had the same amount of political clout and control to stop the spread of the gospel that he had had during the Dark Ages when he murdered the Lollards and the Bohemian Brethren and the Waldensians. Now people like Luther could get away with things other people had been killed for. And it was German princes, German princes who protected Luther. Henry VIII was a terrible man. 
He was against the Reformation. He was Catholic to his eyeballs. It was only for political reasons with Catherine of Oregon and, and wanting an heir to the throne of, of, of England and his womanizing and so forth that he became a Protestant, quote unquote. Henry VIII was a terrible man. He killed 74,000 of his own people. Under him, he had Wolsey murder William Tyndale. The Pope gave him the title Defender of the Faith for his opposing Protestantism. A title still bequeathed to the British monarch that came from the Pope, absurdly. The bad man. Did God use him? Yeah. Despite his womanizing and despite his political gains and despite his murders of believers, despite the death of William Tyndale, despite what he did, God used him. He kicked the Church of England into position as an alternative to the Church of Rome. He replaced the Pope with himself as the title head of the church. He closed down the corrupt Roman Catholic monasteries. And he put Bibles in every church. He allowed English Bibles. They would chain them. They were called chain Bibles to be put in every church. He was a bad man. Did God use him? Oh, yeah. God certainly used him. It allowed England to have a reformation the way Europe did. Now, the Reformation did not end well in either England or Europe, but it began right, and it did present the gospel to a lot of people. God is the God of history. He can use good people, benevolent people, or seemingly good people, like a Mr. Trump or like a Mr. Marius the Mead or a Mr. Cyrus the Great, or we can use bad people like a Mr. Hitler, a Mr. Stalin, or a Mr. Henry VIII. He establishes kings and removes kings. All for his greater purpose. It's always been like this. 16th century. Gutenberg invented the printing press. Now Bibles could be mass produced. Pope couldn't stop the spread of the gospel anymore. Oh, they tried with the Council of Trent and the Counter Reformation, and to some degree succeeded, but the cat was out of the bag. Satan's next strategy was to corrupt Protestantism the way he did Catholicism. And as we can see, he largely succeeded. But let's move on. What's happening now? Now. You need to be careful here. Because God uses a leader, it doesn't necessarily mean the leader is a good man. Henry VIII was not a good man. Hitler, Stalin, obviously were not good men. But in the providence of God, did God use them to bring about the fulfillment of his prophetic agenda? Yes. A lot of Christians now are coming against the godlessness of the American Democratic Party and the international left, people like Trudeau. People like the Labour Party in Britain, particularly people like Andrews in, in Australia or Ahern in New Zealand. <clears throat> and they realize that these are bad people. These are morally debased people pushing the whole homosexual agenda, that they're targeting children. The whole infanticide agenda. They're remaining silent in the face of the human rights abuses and persecution of Christians in China. They're just political whores in the White House and in corridors of power. Christians know that, at least the Christians with any semblance of common sense 
and, 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 and biblical perspectives know it. But they are hoping in a political Messiah instead of in the Messiah. They're wanting God to raise up a Darius the Mede, a Cyrus the Great, or Donald Trump. And he may do so. But even if it's a Hitler or a Stalin, you look at Ping and China. <laughs> or Rendisi in Iran, or Kim Jong-un in Korea. There's no shortage of people who are in the character of Hitler and Stalin in the world today. You have basically anti-democratic political fascist leaders in Canada and Australia and New Zealand. It would be very hard to consider Canada and Australia to be democratic countries anymore in the sense that they once were. Do you look at the United States? People guilty of crimes that should be arrested and indicted, like Biden's son and Hillary Clinton, nothing happens to them, despite the evidence. But someone else who's a political enemy, they have 20, 30 FBI agents with automatic weapons kicking the door in in the middle of the night. It's the political police force, the Gestapo. Why is that happening? Why is democracy disappearing? We know why. When a nation turns against the God of his fathers, the blessings that that God has given begin to disappear. We know that the founders of parliamentary and presidential democracy understood that democracy had to be a nation of laws, not of men, based on the law of God according to the Judeo-Christian scriptures. You turn against that, the democracy goes. Again, we've said this a thousand times. But they're looking for somebody to restore it. Let's take the case of my fellow New Yorker, Donald Trump. In Israel, he is seen by Israelis on a popular level, as a King Cyrus figure. They put out coins with his picture on it. They named a village after him on the Golan Heights. He moved the American embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv, recognizing it as the capital. He stood up for Israel against the Iranians. No question he did that. He was also sympathetic to evangelicals on the issue of abortion and Christian rights. What's happening in China and so forth. All of that is true. But let's look at the whole picture. Does he have a, a problem with Peter Thiel, a homosexual, who's married to whatever, or does he have a problem with, with, with homosexual, or Peter Grenville, who he appointed as ambassador to Germany, and then a high position in the State Department, did he appoint homosexuals to key positions despite their sexual orientation? Yes. Yes. Now, you can say he's not discriminating against homosexuals, okay, but he's not opposed to it. You realize at one time in the 1950s and 1960s, somebody who was a homosexual would be seen as a national security risk. It would have been seen as a moral and a natural. But Donald Trump is good with it now. Rolf Giuliani is good with it. The kind of politicians Christians are going with have compromised on this issue. Now, if you wanted to say something like, your sexual orientation is your business. We don't care. Don't ask, don't tell, the way Clinton did. 
that would be one thing. But when children are being taught by transvestites how to read in school at the taxpayer's expense, When Rudolf Giuliani, the conservative Republican mayor of New York, marches in a gay lesbian parade in New York, where the political right accepts someone like Dave Rubin, who has a husband, and he's an icon of conservative ideology. You can't say that these are God's men. But let's go back to Mr. Trump, who I pray for regularly, and who I voted for twice. My fellow New Yorker, Donald Trump. Jared Kirshner, son-in-law, is an unbelieving Jew, an unsaved Jew, who does not have faith, a saving faith in his Messiah, Yeshua, as far as anybody knows. He's an unsaved Jew. And he brokered the Abraham Accords, or the Abrahamic Accords. An interfaith worship center in Abu Dhabi. But it's not a born-again gospel preaching Christian presence. It has a synagogue with rabbis. It has a mosque with imams. And it has a nominal Christian church, but not a gospel preaching church. And this is seen as a great breakthrough. Well, Saudi Arabia is still persecuting Christians. What else are we saying? It is the Antichrist and false prophet who are going to bring about a false peace in the Middle East, the way Pompey did. Promising to protect the Jews and Israel from the Iranians, from the Persians, the way Pompey did. Then Phrygia. Daniel calls this a covenant with death. Now, again, the Antichrist and false prophet are going to unite the world's false religious system. And they're, of course, in the process of, of Satan is in the process of doing it. This is what I would like to consider. <clears throat> God is the God of history. He's the Lord of history. Antichrist imitates Christ or counterfeits Christ. When Jesus came the first time, you had something called Pax Romana. Pax Romana. Rome had the ultimate military hand that it could control how far other nations could go. There were other powers. Some benign, like Armenia, some potentially hostile, like Iran, Phrygia, the Persians. But Rome had the upper hand. It could control how far other nations would go. Secondly, Rome was eclectic. It learned about agriculture from the Egyptians in the, in the Nile Delta. It learned about trade routes, coastal sailing from the Phoenicians. But they built an infrastructure of communication and transportation. They built a road system. You can still see elements of these roads existing today that you can even drive on. The Via Appia, south of Rome, the Via Maris in Israel an arch bridge in Switzerland you can still drive over, built by the Romans. Portions of Roman roads, not just clear dirt path, but, but cobblestones with construction. Chariots, horses, armies, they built a road system. 
that was thousands and thousands of miles, thousands and thousands of kilometers, as well as the navigation systems. Then they had a postal system, a postal system, where Paul could write an epistle, and it could be sent to multiple churches. Romans improved infrastructure, communication, transportation. And they made Greek, not Latin, the lingua franca, the international language. At the same time, there was a large Jewish diaspora, Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, Thessalonica, all of these cities of the Roman Empire had Jewish communities with synagogues. And the Septuagint, the Hebrew scriptures, were put into Greek in the lingua franca. Now everybody, including non-Jews, could read the Hebrew scriptures if they were literate. The same as literacy increased with the Reformation because of John Hus, I'm, I'm being sorry, because of uh, Gutenberg and, and the printed Bible, the printing press. Literacy increased in the 16th century. Under the first century, same thing happened. Literacy increased. And in the 21st century, more and more people have become computer literate. Another subject, but a related one. This was Pax Romana. <clears throat> the Linga Franca, the scriptures in the Linga Franca, monotheistic Jews waiting for the Messiah to come, God-fearing Gentiles who knew the Jews knew the truth, postal system, road system, transportation, and a relative political stability brought about by the Iron Fist of Rome. All of these things were used of God to prepare for the coming of the Messiah and the spread of the gospel. Paul had Roman citizenship. He was able to get away with things and saying things and doing things and proclaiming things. Others could not. He had the right passport. His letters, his epistles could be circulated. He could travel long distances, preaching the gospel and planting churches. <clears throat> Didn't have to worry too much about wars. <clears throat> Rome was still there to maintain the basic stability. God has used these kinds of things throughout history for his purpose. In the age of empire, there was Pax Britannica. God used Britain in that way. Britain sent the missionaries, Hudson Taylor to China, William Carey to India, and so forth. There was a Pax Britannica. Now there's a Pax Americana. God uses these things for his purpose. The United States has sent the most missionaries and the most money for missions and things like this, and has maintained some kind of a global security, and has given the world the internet, the communication systems, and so forth. That came from the States. Okay, God used Pax Romana. God used Pax Britannica. God used Pax Americana. God is the God of history. But at the close of the age, that lordship will be handed over to Satan for three and a half years. That's a frightening prospect in itself, but it's not just a prospect, it's a certainty it'll eventually happen. And Christians need to realize that. Now again, the Romans had a pantheon and religio licita. You could have any religion you wanted. It was all legitimate as long as you acknowledge the emperor. That teaches about 
what's going to happen with the Antichrist and false prophet. God used Pax Romana for his purposes in preparing for the coming of the Christ and the dissemination of the gospel. At the end of the age, Satan will have his functional equivalent. He is going to do the same thing for the coming of Antichrist that God did for the coming of Christ. He's going to counterfeit it. He's already counterfeiting it. You see this in the EU. You see this in the American government. You see this in the World Economic Forum. You see it in the interfaith movement. You see it in the so-called woke thing, in the pandemic thing. He's preparing the world for the coming of Antichrist. And he's preparing the apostate church for the coming of Antichrist. And while the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the return of Christ, working through the Sitzim name in the spirit of the age, the spirit of Antichrist is setting the world up. He's setting the apostate church up, and he's setting up unbelievable, unbelieving Israel and the Jews for a false messiah. When I see things like the Abrahamic Accords, initiated, organized, the brainchild of the Trump administration, I can look at it politically and say, well, that's bringing Israel <clears throat> into a temporary, howbeit precarious peace with the Arab nations against Iran and the Iranian threat. In light of Daniel 10, I can say that, and that would be true. But I also know the Antichrist and false prophet are going to bring a false peace to the Middle East. The Abrahamic Accords, the three monotheistic religions. Christendom, I wouldn't call it Christianity. Talmudic Judaism and Islam. Isn't it wonderful? No, it's not wonderful. It's Antichrist. Now, again, I'm not attacking Mr. Trump personally. I voted for him. I prayed for him. I liked most of what he did. And I hope Mr. Kirshner comes to know his Messiah, Yeshua. But my faith is not in any political outcome of any election. None of our faith should be in a political outcome. Those things are ultimately going to be in the hand of Antichrist and false prophet until Christ returns. When Christ returns, the government will be upon his shoulder. That is the political outcome I look to. When Christ returns and the government is on his shoulder, that we can look to. <clears throat> that we can and should hope in and trust in. <clears throat> But in the meantime, we need to be very, very careful. Things like the Abrahamic Accords should make alarm bells sound. And now Biden is hypocritically building on it, even though it was Mr. Trump's brainchild, or he's trying to. Remember, if possible, the elect will be deceived. Satan has already deceived the nations. He has already deceived unbelieving Israel. And he's already deceived most of Christendom. Now he is trying to deceive the body of Christ. In the grace and mercy of the Lord, 
may he not succeed in his goal and his strategy to deceive us. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash, RTN Christian TV Scotland, and on Moriel TV. Every blessing. Have a great weekend.